Welcome everyone. Tonight we have author Tracy Lander Garrett and she's going to be teaching you about fantasy world building. Tracy is the author of the Madison Roberts Urban Fantasy Series. She was born in the village of Sleepy Hollow and loves all things spooky, paranormal, and romantic. She currently teaches in Austin Public Library's Badger Dog Creative Writing Program and she lives in Central Texas with her husband and five annoyingly adorable senior cats. Welcome Tracy. Hi, thank you so much, Betty. Uh, so today I'm just gonna do a uh, presentation on fantasy world building and some tips about managing magic monsters and myth. So uh, the first question as I was thinking about how do I even wanna structure this class is how do we define fantasy? And there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of different definitions online and they're all essentially the same i think for me ultimately uh the fantasy genre indicates a story is set in a universe in which magic monsters and or myths are real so um <laughs> from that we have a bewildering list of subgenres from high fantasy and epic fantasy portal fantasy when you go through a door and you end up in this other place kind of uh you know your narnia type of situation urban fantasy paranormal uh fairy tale retellings children's fantasy young adult fantasy superhero fantasy space fantasy gothic fantasy i mean there's just all of these things and they're all fantasy. So how do you fit all of these things under that one umbrella? Um, and again, monsters, magic, mythology. So uh, I know you weren't probably expecting to be tested on your knowledge about fantasy this evening uh, or today, whenever you happen to be watching this. But uh, I'm wondering if you can identify the world or title in the following slides. And uh, I'm wondering if you believe that it is or isn't fantasy. So this first one, I don't know if you wanna jump in with a guess as to what this is here. Um, if anybody recognizes that round door and garden situation happening there. Uh, the Shire, yes, from uh, J.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Uh, very much a fantasy setting, um, high fantasy. You've got elves, you've got dwarves, you've got wizards, you've got monsters, you've got ancient myths about these angel guys. Um, you've got all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Uh, so definitely fantasy. How about this one? Probably a pretty familiar face here. Maybe yelling a, a rather familiar exto, ex, expecto patronum. Expecto Patronum, you're a wizard, Harry. Yes, the Harry Potter universe. Uh, you've got your wizards, you've got all kinds of monsters, uh, and definitely like a long mythology about how the Hogwarts houses got together and all kinds of things. Oh, who could we be looking at here? You don't tend to think of uh, the yellow brick road or the emerald city as fantasy and yet once again you know we're dealing with wizard of oz here we've got magic with the slippers we have stories of how the wizard came to the city and how he took over and the things that he did there um the everything hints at a much bigger universe and there are definitely monsters from flying monkeys to trees that will attack you etc Moving on to our next slide, Alice in Wonderland. I'm, I'm not letting you guess anymore because I don't know if you're even there. Uh, so again, you've got magic. She can eat from a mushroom and shrink or grow. Uh, there's these strange creatures where a child turns into a pig. You've got fish footmen. You've got all kinds of strange characters, these cards that come to life and attack people. Uh, and of course, you know, depending on your definition of a monster, the Red Queen might kind of fit in there in some ways. Uh, moving right along. Anybody recognize these guys? Again, like it's a cartoon, but it's fantasy. There's magic, there's mythology, there's monsters that these, these characters have to fight against or uh, try to get along with. And how about this one? Anybody recognize this? Yes, the ponies are definitely fantasy. What do you think about 
this one with these uh, dragon type characters and all these bones and things in the foreground. Dragons, definitely monsters. This is a, a shot from the Game of Thrones TV show, which is based on George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, uh, which definitely, in some ways, it's not a very magical world, and yet magic does occur. So we'll get in a little bit more of a discussion about the, the scope of magic in some of these things. Um, and then finally, uh, if you uh, grew up during the 20th century, <laughs> you may be familiar with this character. Oh, is Buffy your favorite? Again, you have, you know, it's it's urban fantasy, ultimately, and it's horror in some ways as well, supernatural fantasy, or is it more of a, you know, paranormal romance sort of thing where she's getting involved with all of these uh, supernatural guys? Uh, so there's a lot of different things going on, but these are all, when I'm talking about fantasy, I'm kind of putting all of these different uh subgenres into uh, discussion. So if you're thinking about creating your own fantasy world, some questions that you might ask um, or think about is what kind of fantasy worlds speak to you? You know, if you think about what kind of feelings you want your world to evoke, you know, the the world of I Little Pony is a very sweet, uh, bright and safe world most of the time, maybe not all the time. Um, whereas, say, uh, the world of Pan Am in The Hunger Games uh, is definitely more of a dark, gritty, sad world. Uh, definitely, I would say, I keep saying definitely, I've said definitely like 20 times already. I'm so nervous. I get very nervous when I'm teaching. Uh, the Game of Thrones world, also dark and gritty, but still fantasy. Um, so for this exercise, uh, if you give yourself a three to five minute start to write, uh, ask yourself, just choose one of these four options and do a little bit of writing. Is your world a fallen world in need of a savior? Try describing a catastrophe that plunged the world into darkness. Or is it more of a banal world where magic is forgotten? Then maybe you could explain how the magic was repressed, for how long, and why. Maybe it's a world of sunshine and rainbows in danger from melodramatic evil. Describe an image of evil that amuses you. Or if your world hasn't quite coalesced yet, you could try writing about moods, colors, images, um, anything that would kind of lift your imagination up. Again, give yourself three to five minutes, answer some of these questions, right? These are things to think about when you're creating your own world. So uh, moving on in that case, let's talk a little bit about magic. So the scope of magic, right? All fantasy worlds are all fantasy stories from magical realism, which is going to be more like a one with a single magical element, no other really magical things, uh, all the way to, you know, My Little Pony where anything and everything can be magical, even the grass. Um, where somewhere in between, number five, there's magic, but it's limited in some ways, maybe more of like a Harry Potter situation um, where, you know, there is magic, but not every single little thing is magical and there's kind of this hidden magical world. So then the question is, is how magical is your world? What what intrigues you? You know, what what levels of magic are you most attracted to as a writer? What excites you about magic? All the things that you can do with it, writing the history of it, figuring out a rule system for it, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, things to consider, mo magic, mo problems, the more magic you incorporate into your world, the more problems it can solve. Great. But the problem with that is that fiction lives on problems. The more conflicts in the story, the better. When a story is easy, it's not interesting. 
um, you take two characters and uh, they love each other. So they get together, they get married. The end. Boring. Not exciting. Two characters hate each other, but they have to get married. Already we're interested. Why do they have to get married? What's going on? Why do they hate each other? Already these little tiny conflicts are making us more interested in the story. It complicates things. So if your magic can solve anything from love and hatred to changing time and bringing people back from the dead, the dramatic tension gets sucked out of the story like helium from a balloon, um, which is better left for squeaky voices telling subtle stories. Um, so the most powerful magic that you have has to be balanced with limitations to keep your tension and conflict in place. And whether that's phenomenal cosmic power, or uh, something like in Firestarter where, you know, she loses control over her magic and everything burns down around her and she's fighting, fighting, fighting. Or uh, in Firestarter, her father is using his telepathy powers and his nose starts to bleed. He can't do it for very long. He gets these terrible headaches. Those kinds of limitations can put a cap on magic and prevent characters from becoming too powerful and solving everything too quickly. Um, the other thing about magic is that idea of schools and rules. So there's how magical is the world? Is it very magical or only kind of magical? But how does magic work? Um, fantasy author Brandon Sanderson, who's uh, known for the Wheel of Time series, he took over uh, when the author of that series passed away, and he has a number of his own series. And he refers to this as hard versus soft magic, um, that idea of a rule system for magic. So a hard magic system has a rigid, defined rule structure, whereas soft magic in fiction is going to be represented in more abstract ways. So then the question is, which, again, as an author, which do you prefer? What ideas do you have about how magic works in your world? Are there people who are just imbued with magic or do they go for special training and they study with a master who teaches them how the magic works? Do they have to use wands and special words and uh, swish and flick and leviosa, not leviosa, um, or whatever? What kinds of trappings uh, is this magical world? involved with. Uh, like in Doctor Strange, do they have to make all kinds of strange geometric shapes with their hands? What is it that creates magic? Um, is it a deal that one makes with a fairy who then gives them that power? Um, or do they learn the secret uh, science of naming objects and having power over them that way in the uh, Name of the Wind, Patrick Rothfuss series. So you get a lot of different kinds of magic in different fantasy. Again, you know, what excites you as a writer? Sanderson loves writing magical rule systems. This guy is like, he's all about it. Um, for me, I like having some ideas about how magic works in my fictional world. But I also want to have uh, some leeway. I don't want to stick so much to the hard and fast rules. And I don't want to bore my readers with a bunch of rules about how things work. So um, I like the illusion of a hard magic system. But uh, in truth, I prefer soft, I think. Uh, so I think we're going to move on now from magic to monsters. So what about monsters? Metamorph metaphor morphies your monsters. That's that's my my uh I don't know, I wouldn't call it a, a tagline or anything, but I, I sort of made can you tell I made that up? I made that up. Uh a monster's never just a monster. It it's there, it's part of the story, but is it an outside threat? Is it representative of an inner temptation? Is it representative of the dark side of all of us? Um, you know, your job as a writer is to create specific monsters that have depth, purpose, and metaphor. Even familiar monsters can be morphed in some way that makes them new and unique to your fiction. 
Uh, and I think that that's one of the fun things about using monsters that already exist is by making them new in some way. So uh, we're going to look at some some movie monsters uh, and think about what they represent as well as some differences between them uh, and some of the more common uh vehicles i guess is the right word for that so anyway night of the living dead return of the living dead so the zombie can represent fear of humanity uh you know anytime anyone you know might turn against you but you know in some versions zombies eat brains and some versions they're fast and some they're slow and some they're smart some they're dumb uh, you know, some they can be brought back from zombiehood and turned back into people again, um, and all all manner of things in between. But every person who creates these monsters and brings them into uh, to an audience adds their own dash of flavor, as we'll see as as we continue looking at these creatures. So here we've got an American werewolf in London on the left. Uh, the werewolf is ultimately about fear of oneself, that we could become a monster and hurt others, right? People who we love, people we care about, innocent people. Uh, and on the right, we have a, <laughs> a, a dog from uh, Bitten, uh, a wolf there. Uh, so what we're looking at here morphs you know are, is werewolfism is it hereditary or are you bitten to become a vampire do you morph into a full wolf or into a wolf man or into both do you have memories of what happens while you're a werewolf or not um can you see ghosts because you're a werewolf and have killed people or uh you know do silver bullets work or don't they uh so you get to kind of play around with all of those things each one has a very different feel to it as well. Here with the vampire, right? The vampire is a power fantasy. You want to be young, strong, and sexy forever. But at what cost? Different morphs, right? Everyone who does vampires does something interesting and new with them. Are they you know, allergic to sunlight? Do they blow up? What happens to them in the sunlight? What about garlic or crosses or steaks? Do they stay young looking forever? Um, or do they age strangely depending on what's happening? Uh, do they have super strength? Can they fly? Can they transform into bats? Uh, you know, I think I, oh, I took mirrors off. I had mirrors on here earlier. Can they see their reflections in mirrors? Can they hypnotize people? Do they get crazy demon face? Are they from demons? Uh, do they drink animal blood? Do they sparkle? All kinds of different questions about vampires. And again, as the creator of your world, you decide what elements of the vampire do you like? Which ones do you not like? How do you keep the balance in terms of power? How do you keep your vampires monstrous? Or how do you turn them into objects of romance and affection? There are different ways of, of handling these things. Uh, here we go. Mutants and aliens. So these characters would represent society's outcasts. They're feared by the mainstream, but they're sympathetic to the reader. Uh, with morphs, you, I mean, you mutate away. You can do all kinds of things, although blue skin seems to be a popular choice. Uh, or what about unabashedly evil or just hungry monsters? We need those too. Good guys do need someone to fight, and your morph should be large, dark, and or weird. So we've got Legend on the left and Star Wars Return of the Jedi's Rancor from on the right. So thinking about that bewildering long list of monsters, we're going to ask you to think about your creatures in your world. So again, what you'll want to do is pause this video and do a three-minute timed writing. Give yourself an extra one to two minutes if you're super excited and going for it. But you know, just choose one of the types of monsters that we just mentioned or another monster that you're drawn to. Now imagine this creature in your world. So how are they like the traditional version of that monster? How are they different? 
maybe come up with a do and don't list, such as my zombies do attack people, they don't eat brains. So give yourself three to five minutes and write about this. Excuse me. Things to consider. Strengths, weaknesses, enemies, allies, food, rest, reproduction, physical differences, effects on others. And there's all kinds of other things that you can choose to go farther about, but that's a good start, I think. So again, three to five minutes for that one. Take another drink of water. All right, moving forward, we come to myth. <clears throat> so what about myth? Generally speaking, it helps to know what the backstory of your world is. Even if you don't tell the reader about that, just knowing about it as a writer will help you make your world more real. Little hints, little details, little aspects will hint at the larger world that you've created, even if you don't tell your readers exactly where the monsters come from or who created this world or what the history of magic is. But having those things worked out ahead of time, especially if you're a planner, um, as opposed to a, uh, it's a pantser and a plotter, right? Pantser, plotser, I can't remember now suddenly. Uh, it's that idea of people who are plotters write outlines, they, they plan everything ahead of time. Pantsers write by the seat of their pants. And then there are some people who write outlines, but then kind of pants it along the way. Um, so for plotters, definitely like origins and creation myths and things like that are, are, are great. Unless you spend 15 years only writing myths and never actually write your story. So you have to find kind of a balance. Um, so myths tell us about values held dear by their cultures, origin and creation stories within a world will give readers hints about important themes and motifs in your work. So, um, for example, Anne Rice's Vampire Lestat series creates demonic Egyptian origins for their immortals, emphasizing bloodthirsty violence and selfishness. You now, that demon thread really runs through a lot of vampire mythologies, but not all of them. But it's interesting to see it there. Moving on, Harry Pratchett's Discworld, Discworld series. Uh, the world is a flat plane sitting on top of four elephants astride the shell of a giant turtle named Atuin. And Atuin looks forward to some unknown event, apparently, symbolizing solid foundations and an optimistic outlook. Back to Harry Potter. Uh, tackles the history of the muggle or non-magical people and wizard relations, the magical houses and their founders, and much more to showcase values such as kindness, courage, and fortitude. And in James Cameron, Cameron's Avatar, the Navi tells stories of great warriors who led their people to victory in times of great sorrow. And the myth foretells or foreshadows Jake Sully's transformation into Torok Makto and his dedication to the Navi. So you kind of get these threads of, or I guess threads of themes and motifs, these stories that are kind of important to the rest of your world, the rest of your story, the stories that you want to tell, kind of like echoing and traveling through um, from the myth to the today of your story. Uh, which brings us to the question of your myths. And again, I gave you another three to five minute exercise on this one. And I ask, will the world have several peoples, each with their own origin story, like in J.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth, a fantastic world of magic and mythological creatures like C.S. Lewis's Narnia, 
or J.M. Barry's Neverland? Is it like our world, but with a secret world of weird trolls or demons living just beyond sight, as in Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away or Cassandra Clare's Shadow Hunter series? You know, I think that's kind of the bread and butter of some of the, the urban fantasy that, that we tend to see is that that hidden away secret world of, you know, ghosts, monsters, etc. Um, your fantasy world ultimately will be unique to you, whether it's dark and deadly like George R. R. Martin's uh, Game of Thrones Song of Ice and Fire, or whether it's light and fluffy like the world of My Little Pony. Um, and the next two questions that I ask you to answer in three to five minutes are what themes are important for your world? What, what themes are important for your world? You know, as a writer, um, I find myself thinking about uh, mental health issues. I think about bravery. I think about friendship. I think about romance. I think about uh, the role of the individual in society and heroisms and, you know, learning to trust yourself. And, you know, all of those things are the kinds of stories that I'm attracted to as a reader and as a viewer. So I want to bring that into my own world as well. How do I tell those stories? You know, how do I create a character who feels real in her struggles and her triumphs? So what themes are important for your world? What, what stories are you attracted to? What kind of story would emphasize a theme of friendship? What kind of story would emphasize uh, the, you know, learning to rely on oneself? You know, what kinds of myths could be told that would then be echoed in the story in one way or another? Okay, well, I'll go ahead and let you go for tonight. And we're going to post this to YouTube so everyone can watch it and hopefully work on their exercises. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you so much, Betty, for having me. <laughs> Bye. Bye.